Well, hey there, gang. That'll strike fear into the heart of almost any guitar player. We're going to be doing two different bridge reglues today and see if we can compare and contrast them. Okay, let's open up the pronunciation floodgates, shall we? I've heard them called takamines, takaminis, in one case it was takamini. Uh, in Japanese, I believe it's probably closest to takamine, but whatever it is, it's made in 2012 and it's in desperate need of help. Maybe we can just call it the tack. So yeah, um, sometimes this happens incrementally over a long period of years. A little crack forms at the back and over time it slowly moves up and up and up. Other times it's a great big explosive failure and it's really exciting when it happens. Uh, I'm betting this was in the latter group. The other thing is... As it comes to me, it's still under some tension. If this ever happens to you, I'd suggest detuning all of the strings completely, immediately. Uh, it doesn't have as much tension on it now, but there's still enough to bend and deform the bridge a little bit, which means I have to unbend it, and sometimes it doesn't want to cooperate. Um, or it can cause more damage to the soundboard, because you're localizing all of that tension on a smaller and smaller area, right? There's more chance for it to rip out. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Actually, that saddle appears to be in backwards. So, some setup will be required, I'm sure. I should apologize, actually, for that last video with the Martin setup, because I managed to misplace a whole scene in which I described the uh, neck relief, both measuring it and adjusting it. It's just one of those things. Um, I can have upwards of 85 individual shots in a 20-minute video, and sometimes something goes wrong. I tend to edit them at about 2 o'clock in the morning as well, so you know, it just didn't register didn't get put in, and uh, so I apologize for that grievous error. Okay, so two little round plastic inserts on either side of the bridge. Anytime you see round inlays on a bridge, usually it means that they're trying to hide some screws, so that's fine. Um, there's a metal pickup strip in this. The other thing though is halfway along the back of the bridge, there's other inserts, which is very unusual. They don't appear on the top side. So to my mind, that is stupid and irresponsible design. Because if I ever have to take this bridge off, like if it had started to lift and I wanted to pull it, I wouldn't know those are there. It might make it very difficult. So, see if we can get as much of this out of the way before we actually take the bridge off. What does it look like on the inside? There is a metal pickup plate screwed directly to the underside of the uh, bridge pad. And there you can see those locating pins on either side. Get these little plastic dots out of there. Those seem to be just a press fit, which is nice. Sometimes the pearl dots are glued in and have to heat those up with um, some steam. It's a funny system. It's almost like the adjustable bridge in 1960s Gibsons. Okay, that's uh, freed up from underside. Wow. Okay. That came right off. I'd like you to appreciate just how deformed and broken this thing actually is. This isn't a plywood top, this is solid wood which is buckled and broken between the pinholes and this gaping chasm that they carved out for the pickup. And uh, it seems to have been glued on with epoxy and not very much of it. Um, this has got that classic case where they've actually scuffed the finish under the bridge here, hoping that the epoxy would have some kind of mechanical hold, but there's a lip between the finish and the bare wood. so. You know, the contact point for this bridge is a tiny, tiny little area around the outside. Uh, and then, of course, with this big hole here, there's an, that's prime real estate in a standard bridge. That's where a lot of the stress is centered. And it's missing. It's gone. So, eek. I don't know. Okay, we're going to put a halt to this one for a little while. I contacted the shop that contracted this work to me so that they can talk to the customer because this is no longer a simple bridge re-glue.
patching that soundboard is one thing, but the main issue is the bridge pad. It's broken through, and it, it just it has to come out of there. Doing that, making a new one, it's major surgery, it's very time-consuming, and it basically doubles the estimates. So we have to see what they want to do. Uh, I know what I want to do to like the designer who put this one on paper, because, I mean, really? It reminds me of that cigar box guitar we worked on a couple months back, you know, the one, like, let's cut a great big hole right where the stresses are most concentrated. And we've got this half of the soundboard being pulled up, this half being pushed down, and they can do that independently of each other now. And, you know, in this case, let's also introduce a half-inch thick chunk of metal in there to act like a lever and just really tear it up, you know? Like, seriously, what were you thinking? I mean, you... Your mother and I. At this point, we can't even be angry. We're just deeply, deeply disappointed in your choices and the man you've become. No, she won't speak to you. I think you should just go. Up next, we have one of these fancy newfangled Martins uh, with some design elements that I think are more at home on a tailor than a Martin, but to each their own. This is a GPC PA-1 from 2011. And at first glance, it seems to be in much better shape than that previous guitar. At least there's a lot more bridge in contact with the soundboard. But I'm told that it is loose back here. If it is, it's really close. It's tight. Got a piece of paper and we'll see what's going on. And yes, it is. Okay. Actually, that's kind of fun, this little detail where it recurves at the end of the belly. Fancy. So, how far does it go? Oh. Actually, oh, okay, that's, that's a lot more than I was led to believe, actually. This whole treble side is loose. Um, sometimes, on upper-end guitars, if I know they were made correctly, I can get away with just sanding out the old glue uh, with some fine sandpaper, putting new glue in there and clamping it closed, but in this case so much of it's detached that I'm going to have to take this off and make sure there's proper contact and then re-glue the whole thing. Have a look at the front edge of this bridge here. Some funny things going on in the lacquer, it seems, right along that edge. The score mark, or was this previously... oh, there's flakes coming off. Yeah, it's a little funny. This bridge plate seems just fine. There's the insert point for an undersaddle pickup. The little fuzzy wood fibers around the edges of the holes, that's pretty normal for a lot of manufacturers. Just blow out when they uh, drill them. They don't back up the inside of the hole, so things get torn up a bit. This is one of those fantastic undersaddle jobs where they made the hole in the bridge just barely big enough to accommodate the wire lead here, but not the actual pickup portion. So, unlike a lot of other pickups, especially ones in guitars with 1 8 inch saddle slots, you can just push the whole thing down inside. That's not possible in this case. Another instance of a routine job quickly becoming a potential nightmare, because the lead from that pickup snakes its way down and is attached to the preamp board both positive and ground leads via two tiny, tiny little screws. We're talking watchmaker scale, and they're flatheads. So naturally the connections are done under this metal box shielding thingy, which itself is soldered to the board, and then this complex preamp is in turn piggybacked on another board way down in there, affixed to the guitar side with, you know, the controls and the screws. So yeah, um, getting those screws out can be done. The threads are pretty shallow, so you risk popping them loose. Um, and if that happens, think about trying to put them back again. You know, realize that you're working at the end of your reach. You somehow got to get those tiny little wires in the right spots underneath those screws, underneath this, you know, metal thing. And realize, of course, that it's all going to be obscured by your hand as you do it. Ugh. If you drop one of those screws, if it comes out, you know, say goodbye, because there's your afternoon there. Something that small in this environment, good luck. The sane thing to do sometimes is just to chop this wire into somewhere reasonably accessible, pull it out, do the bridge work, then put it back in, solder them back together, and then shrink tube it. Um, that's the sane thing. The practical thing was entirely different, because realize that this could have been done with a simple 1 8 inch mini jack or something. It's kind of hostile, this engineering. Um, 
I don't, I don't think it makes the guitar very serviceable. Could you send it back to Martin and let them worry about it? Maybe, but this guy's got a gig next week. Now there is a third way to do this, and that is to try and enlarge the hole with the wire in place. Now some of the stuff I show you can't really be considered a tutorial. Uh, in the grand scheme of this is how you do it, occasionally you got to go off book and rely on your own sense of skill to get the job done. Sometimes you guys are just along for the ride. Um, because the way I do it, or I've done it, because this is I've only done this once before, and it worked fine, um, is I take a very small carving gouge. It's about two millimeters wide, so it will fit in the slot, and I use that to shield the wire while I drill a hole right beside it. And for safety's sake, I'm going to use a jeweler's pin vise because you know doing by hand the mistakes happen more slowly. Um, Martin doesn't put the hole at the very end of the channel. Uh, there's a little space there. It's a couple of millimeters. It's just big enough to do this. Um, you want to be careful with these Fishman piezos, piezos, uh, the ones they use in the Matrix or the Aura systems. They're not like the LR Bags braided ribbon pickups that you'll find in like the Anthem. These are one. These ones are like they're covered in foil, and they're extremely delicate. So you know you don't want to bash them around. And you really don't want to bend them back and forth. You know, you want to keep them... Just be careful. So let's define the worst case scenario. The bit cuts into the plastic shielding on the cable, exposes the ground wire in there, and potentially nicks that inner hot lead. Could cause a short. And the responsible thing to do in that case is to cut it, re-solder them together, shrink tube them. Um, now remember, this cable diameter is just about the same as the width on the slot, so... That's going to need to be the neatest soldering work you've ever done in your life to keep it small enough with all the heat shrink tubing involved to get it back down in that hole. So, you know, we don't want that to happen if we can help it. Get the carving gouge right up close to the wire. Helps if you're wearing a magnifying lens. And then we'll get in there with the pin vise. And we're going to take our time to do this. I got about three eighths of an inch worth of material to go through, so it's going to take a little time. Okay, so we've got a second hole drilled right up close to the first one. There might be a little bit of material left in there, uh, which we can cut away, and then that thing should go right through. Yay! So I got my little heat blanket working on it there. This will take uh, 10 minutes or so to heat up. I start working on one side, I'll work on the other, and take my time. So after getting things good and hot, the palette knife slips in there pretty easily. You can see I'm protecting the top with a thin piece of mylar here. And um, I'm used to using the palette knives. Some people like a wider blade. Main thing is it should be pretty thin. Uh, it doesn't have to be razor sharp, but the edge has to be really thin and you should really pay attention to grain direction like you don't want to be forcing it in sideways uh, to the grain in such a way that it could dive down into the fibers and you also want to cut from both sides just to make sure that those are freed up so there's no tendency for the knife to go shooting on through if it suddenly gives way this came off pretty cleanly I can feel there's just a couple of fibers in the center there that are being obstinate sort of shave those off and it comes free I'm going to scrape off the remaining wood fibers and any glue that's on the surface, but let's have a look here for a second. You can see that those areas that were previously loose from the top along the back there have a thin skin of wood still sticking to them, but the ones that were uh, heated up and removed with a palette knife are relatively clean. This suggests that it wasn't the glue that gave way, but actually a failure of the top wood itself. And most often that happens when someone gets a little bit too ambitious with uh, the X-Acto knife when they're scribing around the bridge um, into the lacquer before gluing it on in the first place. If you go too deep, you can create a line of weakness on the back edge of the bridge. String tension hits it and the wood just sort of peels off itself. So this is a good lesson to you builders out there. Be really careful with that operation. Do not score into the wood. Just take the lacquer.
With the old glue scraped off, I can now fit this to the top. In order to do that, I want to start off with a bridge that is either flat, both in length and across the width, or just slightly concave. I'm talking like a thousandth of an inch, you know, 0.1 millimeters. Um, just so that when I put this on the top, it's contacting around the outside edge first. And then if I were to put a clamp on the center, it would spread out enough and you'd have good solid contact all the way across. Unfortunately, in this case, especially on the wings, it's warped upwards enough that it's slightly convex. Not so much that I can show you, but exaggeratedly, it, it does this. So I've got to go back and then gently, gently relieve these areas and bring it down so that it's flat or slightly concave. So I can keep track of my progress here. Just putting some pencil lines. I'm not pressing down very hard. I don't want to deform it, you know, from its current sh shape. So this is just, you know, fingertip pressure. I'm not sanding a whole lot away, just enough to sort of give me an indication of where I have to work on it with a scraper. So I can see the high spots and I'll scrape those away and then try this again. Okay, this is some peel and stick sandpaper here. 220 grit. It's um, quite thin. Good flexible adhesive. I'm going to sacrifice the scalpel blade. I see something that looks distressingly like a tool path. Like this was somehow carved out. Like a few thousands carved out with a router. Um, I see little swirl marks. This is a very sharp Japanese chisel. It's in a skew chisel used as a scraper. I'll carefully fit that sandpaper into the outline of the bridge. Once again, I'm using the sanding as more of an indicator, uh, a marker, so I know where to scrape. And I'll vacuum things off before I peel up the sandpaper because you don't want to get the ebony dust into the spruce. It gets really dingy. When you're done, it fits just, it's almost like a little suction between the two pieces. They fit really nicely together. These are the extended throat clamps I use. You can see I've taped on some cork-backed calls. And you better do a test run before you go for it, uh, just to make sure there's not going to be any surprises. Get some glue on the bridge. Clamp it up. When you've got just enough glue on there, you won't see a huge amount of squeeze out, just a few tiny drops. Um, if you get too much glue, it wants to slide around on you and it just gets messy. It's not necessary. It helps to have a light directly underneath the hole in the bridge to help position the pickup for its re-emergence. You turn it in the right direction so that it can come up freely. Pull gently and push gently and let's pause here in this magical moment and recognize the narrator's abject horror and frustration when he realizes that this is going to be a very bad day because that thing bent about five degrees backwards and if you know anything about these pickups you realize that they do not like to bend. They're made of two incredibly thin pieces of copper foil that sandwich the conductive piezo material and if you bend them they break. You can try to solder them back together but you will fail. There's just no way of fixing it. They're very expensive, and at this point we recognize that this is not the way you do this. Maybe you cut it on the other side, but the whole thing, eh, don't try that yourself, because you, like me, will eventually have to fork out for a new pickup to replace the one that just got damaged. So, you know, fun. There's a bunch of cursing going on at this point while I inspect the damage. I want to be optimistic, but in my heart of hearts, I know it's done for, and my suspicions were proved right when I plugged it in. You'll recall when I mentioned having to do the neatest soldering of your life to get this thing to fit? Well, that's what we're up to here. A little piece of heat shrink tubing there, and I've got those wires connected in such a way that they're strong, but there's not going to be any lumps or bumps. And I'm going to keep the uh, actual solder flow as thin as possible, try to pick up any excess so it's going to lie flat. We'll get in close and inspect things, make sure everything's together nicely. Move the heat shrink tubing over in place. We'll get that hot. Don't burn the insulation, please. Just get it warm enough to shrink. Now moving on to the ground wire. 
I'm actually doing this in two joints rather than one so that they won't all align in the center of the wire and cause a big bump because that would not fit down the hole. So they're staggered. And again, you know, I'm working on trying to get this thing as straight and flat as I possibly can, mashing them down. And I'm going to cut off any excess. This one got a little thick, so I'm actually going to file down the solder. Heat shrink the whole kit and caboodle. And while it's still hot, I'll stretch it and pull it out as straight as I can. Okay, I think we're set up. I'm happy to see this one done. Uh, bridges down flat, pickups reinstalled and functional. And what do you guys think of the Aura or other emulation based software inside guitars like this? This one mimics like a number of different mic placements. I don't know, I'm of the mind. I've, Basically, I want to see it in a box on the floor rather than trying to cram it inside the actual instrument. I don't see a reason for... Like, it's bound to get dirtier over time and service is more of a hassle. So, you know, that's just me. So I'll play a few things on this and um, we'll say goodbye. Yeah, so that's a bad day in Luthery. That's one of the days where I'm paying to do this job. It happens. <laughs>